Hello Earth, this is Captain Tom Nicholas speaking to you live from SpaceX Mars Colony 1, codename Eden. But both the E's are spelled with threes and the N is inexplicably an exclamation mark. Uh, today marks 365 Earth days since the spacecraft Dragon 5 touched down safely at Eden Interplanetary Spaceport. And I'm happy to report that everything has gone according to plan. The water mines continue to draw ample moisture from the soil. Food grows and grazes in the agricultural biomes. And more importantly than anything, those who arrived here as refugees have begun to become citizens. What they left behind on Earth in terms of creature comforts is more than made up for in their ability to dream, their newfound capacity to imagine a future beyond rising sea levels and ecological collapse. If this colony represents anything, it is hope and the ability to once again imagine a future for humanity. And wherever you're watching this on Earth, know that you too can join us to live and to dream and to build on that future for the low, low price of just two million dollars. Elon Musk is something of a lightning rod for popular opinion, at least online anyway. To his supporters, he's a continual source of inspiration, a real-life Tony Stark. Not only is he a successful entrepreneur, but an innovator whose swagger is matched only by his unending ambition to make real technologies which previously were the reserve of science fiction. To his detractors, he's a point of ridicule. Someone who seeks to take credit for the work of his engineers and who often proposes solutions to problems for which better, more workable solutions already exist. A great deal has thus been written and said about Elon Musk. On this website, for instance, Oliver Thorne of Philosophy Tube has provided a great examination of how Musk tries to present himself as a kind of countercultural figure, whilst in truth being pretty much the archetypical capitalist in how he runs his companies. In this video, I want to take a different approach. For I don't think that those who hang on Musk's every word have simply been duped. I think that there are ways in which Musk is fairly distinct from the other entrepreneurial figures which surround him. And this distinction lies in his unashamed belief in the future. Tech entrepreneurs in particular often talk about disruption. They regularly try to position the various products that they're bringing to the market as having the potential to completely change the way we live. This lofty rhetoric, however, is soon undercut when it turns out that what they're actually trying to sell us is a microwave that connects to the internet or something similarly mundane. Whatever questions we might raise about Elon Musk's specific proposals for the future, and I will raise a few towards the end of this video, they're at least genuinely pretty bold. One might argue, for instance, that the underground roads that he wants to build as part of his loop project would likely have less impact on congestion and on efforts to combat the climate crisis than simply laying on a few extra buses or metro trains each hour. Nevertheless, the idea of boring a web of roads under a city is, at the very least, genuinely ambitious. While I'll talk a little bit about what I think some of the potential social, economic and political ramifications of the individual projects which comprise what I'm going to refer to as musky and futurism are towards the end of this video, what I want to focus on for the most part is why Musk's vision resonates with so many people. If you're a Musk fan yourself, then you'll likely have your own specific reasons for admiring the man, and I don't want to take those away from you. But I do want to ask more broadly what it is about our contemporary moment and the recent past that makes Musk feel to many like such a breath of fresh air. I want to ask what societal desires Musk's invitations to imagine bold futures respond to. 
Frequent viewers of my channel will not be surprised to learn that doing so is going to involve a bit of a history lesson and a ramble through changing perceptions of the future from the early 20th century to the present day. I hope you'll stick with it though, because understanding how we got to where we are now and how people's relationship to the idea of the future has evolved over time is, I think, essential for gaining a fully contextualised understanding of exactly what Elon Musk is offering us and why our culture has, for the most part, so enthusiastically embraced his futuristic dreams. While many of Elon Musk's ambitious visions for the future remain at concept stage, there's one thing for which we have to give him some credit – the popularisation of the electric car. In a 2019 paper summarising a study into consumer perceptions of electric vehicles, Zoe Long et al wrote that Several participants explained that Tesla changed their perceptions that electric cars are slow, ugly, have limited range and not fun to drive. Several participants noted that Tesla is cool and that owning one communicates a symbolic message to others. As recently as a decade ago, electric cars were seen as pretty lame. Their quietness and eco-credentials were the antithesis of the kind of vehicles that were fetishised in the Fast and Furious franchise or in games such as Gran Turismo, Forza and Grand Theft Auto. Tesla's interventions in the market, however, have changed all of this. Electric cars are now not only more widely available, they're also seen as pretty cool. Of course, neither Elon Musk nor Tesla invented the electric vehicle. Their success lies in having changed the popular perception of an already existing technology. And in this, Musk has more than a little in common with the original automobile entrepreneur, Henry Ford. Similarly to Musk, Henry Ford did not invent the car. Cars had been sold commercially for more than a decade prior to the founding of the Ford Motor Company in 1903. Early automobiles, however, were expensive, hard to come by and often highly unreliable. It was only with the launch of the Ford Model T in 1908 that the motor car became the middle class's preferred means of transportation. The Model T was not only more reliable, but quicker and cheaper to produce, thus meaning that there were more of them available and that they were cheaper to buy. While innovations in the internal engineering of the car likely also played a role, most of this was made possible by the Ford company's innovations in the process of manufacture. Ford used machines to ensure consistency across parts and, rather than having one highly skilled technician assemble the pieces together, broke the assembly process down into individual tasks, which could each be performed by a worker who only needed to be trained in that specific task. This method of manufacture would come to be known as the Fordist model of production and would fundamentally alter how goods were produced the world over. There are further parallels with Musk and Tesla in the present day here too. Although it's not been entirely without its problems, Musk has sought to automate as much of the car manufacturing process as possible in order to similarly increase manufacturing speed and drive down costs. What's more instructive in our attempt to understand the appeal of Muskian futurism in the present day than Ford's technical innovations, however, is the broader cultural atmosphere of the time in which he was working. Two years after the Ford Motor Company began production of the Model T in Detroit, the Italian poet Filippo Marinetti wrote a short document called The Foundation and Manifesto of Futurism. This manifesto, which was shortly published on the front page of the French newspaper Le Figaro, decried futile veneration of the past and exhorted the reader to embrace speed, light, creative destruction and, above all else, the possibilities of the future yet to come. Marinetti's document set the stage for an artistic and social movement known, as the title of the manifesto would suggest, as Futurism. In his desire to break with the past and look excitedly towards the future, however, Marinetti also ably summed up what we might call the spirit of the age. 
much. For human beings haven't always believed in the future. Certainly, people have always known that each day, week, year and decade would be followed by another. Nevertheless, the future hasn't always been viewed as a realm of possibilities, and our journey towards it has not always been viewed as a positive. The Christian faith, for instance, has often seen the passage of time as a negative, as a progressive journey away from the innocence of the Garden of Eden and the Word of God. Across art, industry and politics, however, during the early 20th century, the future came to be celebrated, fetishised even. We can see this in the economic sphere, with industrialists such as Ford racing to find ways of making goods cheaper and of higher quality. We see it in the cultural sphere too. Following Marinetti, artists of all forms and disciplines constantly published manifestos detailing how they would tear up previous expectations of what art could and should be. We see it in the political sphere, in which followers of ideologies including communism, fascism and even the dominant creeds of liberalism and capitalism dreamt up new ways of structuring society. Across each of these spheres, we see attempts to imagine bold futures in which society is almost unrecognisable from the present. All of this is detailed in Franco Berardi's 2011 book, After the Future, in which he christens the 20th century the century that trusted in the future. He writes that the 20th century is pervaded by a religious belief in the future. This belief was perhaps put under some strain by the horrific consequences of fascism in Europe and of Stalinism in the Soviet Union. Nevertheless, after the Second World War, it continued on relatively unabated. One only has to think of the space race, at the heart of which was a utopian, futuristic vision of humanity conquering the stars. Or in the UK, Harold Wilson's declaration that the country would embrace the white heat of technology and undergo a scientific revolution. If such bold appeals to the future existed throughout the 20th century then, why is it that Elon Musk's proposals often feel so unique in the present day? For again, whatever we think of his specific proposals, the unashamed manner in which Musk dares to dream of a future which is on some level different to the present day certainly stands out. And this clearly says something about the way in which the future is viewed elsewhere in our culture, or at least has been viewed until recently. In order to understand why Muskian futurism often seems so unusual in the present, we therefore need to understand what happened in the interim, between the bold dreaming of the 20th century and our present situation. What Berardi refers to as the slow cancellation of the future. Starting in the late 1970s and early 1980s, the undying belief in the future which dominated the 20th century began to steadily decline. Perhaps this was the result of sheer exhaustion. Perhaps this was a result of the economic crises which dominated the period. Either way, we can identify this fading belief in the future as a realm of possibilities, most clearly in the political sphere. After her election as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom in 1979, Margaret Thatcher soon became associated with the slogan, there is no alternative. As she, along with Ronald Reagan in the US, set about transforming society in line with their neoliberal vision, they pushed hard on the idea that their politics was not just one of many possible ways of governing and organising society, but that this was the only logical way of doing so. This kind of rhetorical flourish is certainly not unique to Thatcher, Reagan and other supporters of neoliberal capitalism. Nevertheless, in this case, it gained significant traction throughout society. This was compounded in 1989 when the fall of the Berlin Wall led to the dissolution of the Soviet Union and with it the most prominent an example of an alternative to capitalism. Whatever your views on capitalism, Soviet-style communism or any ideological formation for that matter, it should be possible to see that the absence of any actually existing alternative to the dominant ideology of a period makes it far harder to imagine society being structured differently in the future. Francis Fukuyama famously declared that the collapse of the Soviet Union signalled the end of history. 
He cited the total exhaustion of viable systematic alternatives to Western liberalism as proof that the world had reached the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. In many ways, then, the end of history also meant the end of the future. In contrast to the bold visions of the early 20th century, the politics of the subsequent decades thus became increasingly managerial. In the UK, US and elsewhere, political parties rarely pitched radical proposals for the future, but instead merely sought to present themselves as the least offensive candidates, as reliable administrators of the present. In his 2014 book, Ghosts of My Life, Mark Fisher explores how this was mirrored in the cultural output of the era. He points, for example, to a lack of innovation in popular music, writing that it was through the mutations of popular music that many of those of us who grew up in the 1960s, 70s and 80s learned to measure the passage of cultural time. But faced with 21st century music, it is this very sense of future shock which has disappeared. Where the futurists and other 20th century artists had constantly sought to tear up the perceived rules of their various art forms, Fisher posits that the 21st century music scene was absent of any seismic event in which a band or artist suddenly produced a new sound which shook up expectations. In fact, in the late 2000s and early 2010s, an active distrust in the future became a central theme in English language storytelling. Black Mirror, for instance, works directly on the premise that technologies which we might be tempted to view as enabling a more hopeful future will actually be a corrupting force. More concerningly, until very recently, young adult fiction was dominated by dystopian futures in properties such as The Hunger Games and Divergent. What does it say about a culture when its most popular tales for children envisage a future in which young people will have to fight each other for their very survival? If the 20th century was the century that trusted in the future, both Berardi and Fisher posit that the early 21st century saw the future viewed either with scepticism or dread. The world's coming to terms with the climate emergency and increasing awareness that politicians were doing little to combat it likely also played a role here. What point was there in dreaming of the future when the very planet on which we live has a terminal diagnosis? In the past few years, however, this bleakness and pessimism towards the future has begun to come up against some opposition. And up there among its chief opponents has been one Elon Musk. So, after more than a brief detour through the history of perceptions of the future, we find ourselves back in the present. But I want to argue that the future is making a bit of a comeback. And this is interesting in relation to Berardi and Fisher's work, for both authors display some scepticism about the younger generation, primarily millennials, with Fisher writing that the assumption that the young are automatically at the leading edge of cultural change is now out of date. Both predicted the pessimism of the 80s, 90s and 2000s continuing for some time and being largely accepted by the generations growing up within it. This, however, has not been the case, with Musk being a prime example. Polling of UK residents by YouGov in the past year found that 46% of millennials have a positive opinion of Musk, in comparison to only 22% of Gen Xers and 15% of baby boomers. Despite Musk himself being 49 then, it seems to be millennials who are most responsive to his futuristic vision. And while I remain of the opinion that Musk is relatively unique among other entrepreneurs in his consistent articulation of genuinely bold visions of the future, I think in his gaining popularity primarily amongst millennials, there are similarities between Musk and figures in other spheres which hint at him being not so much a lone wolf than a symptom of a broader cultural shift in popular perceptions of the future. In particular, I think we can identify several parallels between Muskian futurism and a recent expansion of the political imagination. 
On the left, figures such as Bernie Sanders, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and The Squad in the US, and Jeremy Corbyn in the UK have also, when not being millennials themselves, found support primarily among younger generations, and have also set about imagining bold new visions for the future. Where the politics of the previous decade accepted much of the existing dominant order and contented itself with proposing minuscule changes to the status quo, we've seen a research of both politicians and grassroots movements such as Black Lives Matter advocating for comprehensive reform guided by the belief that the future can be better than and fundamentally different to the present. I think that this context, and that of the darker visions of the future offered by the contemporary political right in the form of Donald Trump and the post-Brexit Conservative Party, is essential to understanding why Elon Musk has become such a revered figure in the contemporary moment. I think, in many regards, his appeal lies less in his specific proposals than in the more fundamental fact that he answers a contemporary desire to believe in the future again. We can propose countless reasons why this desire might have re-emerged. I would place the financial crisis of 2008, revelation that neoliberalism was not the perfect system that it had presented itself as, high up on that list. Whatever reason one lands upon, however, what is evident is that people, young people in particular, seem to want to trust in the future again. And Elon Musk answers that call. What remains is to consider what the ramifications of his vision might be. For the most part in this video, I've attempted to contextualise Muskian futurism, to ask what its appeal is and what other social, political, economic and cultural movements it might have something in common with. I want to end by making some observations about Musk's projects themselves. A few weeks back, Musk posted a rendering of the plans for Central Hall Station, one of the stops in the Las Vegas Convention Center loop tunnel system which, according to an article by Mike Brown for Inverse, is designed to take 4,400 attendees per hour in one of two directions over a distance of nearly a mile. The responses to Musk's tweet were filled with people comparing it to other forms of transportation. Many pointed out, for instance, that each car can only take five passengers, with the proposed minivan type pods only being able to take 12. When we take into account the fact that most metro trains can carry more than 1,000 people at any one time, the loop system thus seems to be a little bit lacking. Yet, I don't think this is a bug but a feature. In a 2018 episode of Star Trek Discovery, Musk was mentioned as an example of an innovative pioneer. Now, I've never actually watched an episode of Star Trek, but the world of the show is, I'm told, relatively utopian. In his book Four Futures, Peter Freys uses it as an example of a potential future in which both scarcity and social hierarchy have been eliminated. He writes that we could indeed call it a communist society, in the sense that Marx used the term, a world run according to the principle, from each according to their ability, to each according to their need. I mean, I don't think anyone's under the impression that Musk is any form of communist, although he did once claim to be a socialist and he evidently has a deep understanding of Marx's work. Nevertheless, I do think we can often fall into the trap of assuming that Elon Musk's various projects are about building a future in which, as in Star Trek, we'll all share. When we see mock-ups of the loop system or hear of colonies on Mars, we assume them to be intended to serve everyone and to praise them on that basis. I think this is a mistake, for I don't think Muskian futurism is intended to serve everyone. I think the limited capacity of the loop system is a central feature. This is not a mass public transportation system, this is a proposal for a series of gilded corridors which enable elites such as Musk to get to their destinations quicker and without having to mix with the rest of us. The colonies on Mars too are not a futuristic vision of new life for the many, but a means for the few to escape the effects of the climate crisis. Where the egalitarian mask of Muskian futurism slipped most obviously was in the announcement of the Cybertruck, 
a bulletproof, supposedly solar-powered electric pickup truck. We often think of electric vehicles as being intended to stave off the climate crisis, although whether they're the best means of doing so is itself debatable. This vehicle, however, is not a vehicle for stopping the coming of the end times. This is an early concept of a vehicle for the end times. Speaking to Jay Leno about the Cybertruck, Musk himself stated that we want to be a leader in apocalypse technology. This then is a vehicle for the elite to traverse a world which is both ecologically devastated and in which there is likely to be increasing hostility towards them. So to conclude, Musk's vision of the future may be bold. Muskian futurism may, on the surface, fulfil a present desire to believe in the future again to imagine how human ingenuity might be harnessed in order to overcome the problems of the present and to fundamentally reshape society. The pressing question to ask of these projects, however, is, to my mind, not what their logistical viability might be, but who they're for. To argue that Musk's proposals do not solve the problems they are intended to solve often leads down a path of forcing people to make a choice between the future and the present. And things are not so binary. A better future is possible. The challenge lies in trying to articulate one that is as bold as that offered by Elon Musk, but is one in which we can all share. Thank you so much for watching this little broadcast that I put together. Uh, if you've enjoyed it or found it interesting in some way, then I would be super grateful if you'd consider sharing it with a friend or someone else you might think might uh, get something out of it. Uh, a massive thanks, as always, to Michael V. Brown, to Jay Fraser Cartwright, to Richard, to Kaya Lau, to Lalomi, uh, to David Brothers, and to Chris Brown for uh, being signed up to the top tier of my Patreon. Uh, Patreon support is massively useful. Uh, useful in helping me uh, put together bits like this uh, and to set aside the time to make these videos. Uh, so if you uh, enjoy them and would like to help me make more uh, as well as getting early access to my videos and to scripts and stuff, uh, then you can find out all about how to do so uh, at patreon.com forward slash Tom Nicholas. Uh, thank you so much for watching once again though uh, and have a great week.